ever happened to Larry Buster Crabb? My name is Richard Lamparski, and my guest today is Larry Buster Crabb. We're sitting in a small room, nearly completely surrounded by glass, and I have to keep looking up to make sure that it isn't some kind of uh, torture decompression chamber. <laughs> Ming the Merciless is not looking in. <laughs> uh, Richard, I haven't heard that name in a long, long time. Man. Ming the Merciless? Yeah. Well, I'll begin by saying this. I went over to 6th Avenue yesterday to get um, a picture, an old picture from one of, your, one of your films. And there are a number of shops that specialize in old movie magazines, old motion picture mm -hmm. stills. Mm -hmm. And yours was right up front. So I asked to see a selection, and they showed me some. And I said, um, are these the ones that sell best? And he said, yes, they have six best sellers. I won't name the other people. But uh, you were one. And I said, oh, that's wonderful, because I'm going to interview him tomorrow. He said, well, he said, the interview you really want, though, is the man who played Ming the Merciless. That is the biggest seller they had. Ming, huh? Ming the Merciless. That's he, Charlie I, Middleton. He died, uh, Richard, he died some 10 or 12 years ago. Old Charlie. He was a sweetheart. He passed away. Yeah, yeah. Well, let's find out about uh, Dr. Zarkoff. Uh, that was Frank Shannon. He passed away, too. We did, uh, let's see, we did 42 of the serials of the Flash Gordon serials. The first one started in 1936. We did a second series in 1938, and a third series in 1940. In 1939, we did one series uh, of Buck Rogers which was near so popular as the Flash Gordon series. Correct me if I'm wrong, but I think they were all made into features. Is that correct? They, uh, yes, they would take three or four uh, uh, serious, serious things, you know, and cut them in together, jump where they leave the hero hanging in the air, so to speak, and go on. And they did release them in, in uh, several spots throughout the country as, as a feature picture. And in Europe, the South America... You know, when you go to uh, when you go to a seri uh, a serial picture in India, for example, they come in the morning, and you could never stop after one episode. They sit and see the whole thing. They want to know what's going to happen. They bring their lunch. Did you know that? No, I didn't. That's right, in India. Well, uh, evidently it's the same here because they you know they put them together as a feature, and I saw them. Well, I had seen them when they were originally released, both the serials and the features. But I saw them again about two years ago at a theater here called The New Yorker. It specializes in revivals and re was that, uh, was that a Walter Reed picture house? No, it's okay. an independent house. Uh -huh. It's uh, up on Broadway about, uh, oh, in the 80s. And I went, it was one night only, two Flash Gordon films. One right after the other? One right after the other. And um, Did it a double hold? bill. Did it hold? It not only held, but I want to tell you, I've been in many theaters because I live in movie theaters and I've been going since I was four. I have never gotten the same atmosphere, vibration that I did Is in that, that right? audience. <laughs> I took a friend of mine who's well, exactly like my that. age and they were, it was one full house with a big balcony packed jam full of depression babies reliving their childhood. For God's sake. And days. every movement you made, you didn't slap a clay man's face that it didn't bring down the house with applause. <laughs> <laughs> and Ming the Merciless was booed and hissed. Oh, yes. This was a great song. evening, yeah. Ming the Merciless. Well, um, and you did Buck Rogers, which wasn't quite a success. No, no, it was not. And also Tarzan. Yes, as a matter of fact, when I started off in the picture business, uh... I, I did, my first picture was the picture for Paramount. It was called King of the Jungle. It was from an Englishman's book. Uh, the book was called The Lion's Way. It was a steal of, of, of Tarzan. Uh, what the fellow did was, rather than have Casper, who was uh, Tarzan, so to speak, uh, being raised by the, um, by the monkeys, by the, the chimpanzees, um, this fellow was raised by the lions. A mother lion took him over and brought him up, so he lived and grew up with the lions. And later on in the picture, they captured him. A, a circus uh, uh, group was out to get some animals for this circus of theirs. And they captured this fellow and brought him and uh, had him work with the lions in this circus. That's how I got to the States. I broke out of my cage as we neared shore on this old freighter, swam the shore, and uh, ran up. Uh, landed in Hermosa Beach and, and uh, came out in the park in, in Pasadena 
and uh, heard the sirens, and it um, it excited me, and I climbed a tree and went in through a window. And uh, Nidia Westman and Francis D. were two school teachers in the apartment that I went into. And as it turned out, they were the only ones that could keep me quiet because I wanted to fight everybody or run, you see. And uh, so the circus hired her to teach me how to talk. And that's the way uh, the, the, the picture went. It was quite a good picture, as a matter of fact. It took 14 weeks to make it. And um, they took me kind of damp. Uh, right after the Olympic Games out of a swimming pool and all of a sudden I was an actor. I was not and uh, was never really interested in working before the camera. I think we should say that you won the Olympics for the United States in 1932. That's right. I won the 400, uh, 400 meters in, in Los Angeles. That's right. That I was always interested in what went on behind the camera. I was very interested in directing. Uh, it's kind of a frustrating thing. Another thing is that the people even now, and this, this goes back quite a long time, people even now see me on the street. They've never said, there goes Buster Crabbe, the actor. There goes Buster Crabbe, the guy that played Flash Gordon, or there goes Buster Crabbe, the swimmer, or some such. Billy the Kid, you know, and the westerns I used to make for Eddie Small. Does that bother that. you at all? Think being thought of as the character rather than the actor? <laughs> well, I uh, I really don't know. I'd like to have some fellow say, uh, yeah, he's an actor, <laughs> you know, because I've been in and around the entertainment business since right after the Olympic Games, 1932. Well, if you're not an actor now, after all of those, uh, yeah. after all those things, were you were you picked um, for the role because? You yes, we were all out the Olympic Village getting ready for the games, and they were looking for a fellow to play the part in the King of the Jungle, this Casper part. And they picked uh, about 40 of us, picked us up one day in a big bus. It was kind of a, a busman's holiday for most of us, although I'd gone to USC to college, and I'd worked as an extra when they needed a college guy, when they needed a football player, some, you know, to fill in. Uh, they uh, got uh, many of us from school, from USC, so that I knew a little bit about the, uh, the picture business. But for most of these boys that went along with it that day, and as I say, they were from all countries and from all over the world and 40, uh, it was a real holiday to see people walking around a lot like Gary Cooper and the Carol Lombard, you know. Maurice Chevalier was a big star then. Mae West, Bing Crosby, Richard Ireland. I could go on ad infinitum. Um, they took us in and they showed us around a lot and then they took us in for lunch and we were all eyes and ears, you know, seeing all these people we'd seen many, many times on the screen. And then right after that, they uh, took us into a studio and gave us, in effect, a, a photographic test. They put uh, um, a loincloth on us, you know, uh, a G-string, so to speak, and uh, they didn't have anything in mind. They had a big uh, paper mache rock there, and we all had to pick this darn rock up and throw it off the scene, and then there was a spear, and we threw that off, and then we had to holler like a lion. We all wanted to know how does a lion sound, so we all woof woofed around, and then they took a straight-on shot of us, uh, close up, uh, right uh, side and left side, and that was it. Uh, I don't think that the whole test for the 40 of us took more than two hours. We were in and out, you know. And back on the bus, we went back to the village, and we kidded about who we'd seen and what that. And, uh, well, the uh, games got started after that. And right after the Olympic Games, I got a call. They wanted to get take another test of me, and this time I worked with a girl. I worked with Gail Patrick, who had come out there to do um, the Panther Woman. Um, she didn't do it, but they kept her on the contract. I did a test with her. I took, uh, well, in all, I took five tests. The two producers of the show and the two directors uh, couldn't decide. There were three of us left. Couldn't decide who they wanted. I've always had a soft spot in my heart for secretaries, and this is how it happened. They finally decided to get 25 of the secretaries who worked at Paramount Studio into a projection room. And they ran this test, these three tests off for them, and then they had them vote. And that's the way I got into the picture business. What an interesting idea. I think they should have done that more, you know, rather than a lot of moguls sitting around in a projection room. I was quite lucky because uh, uh, Randy Scott was one of them. He was young then, you know. He didn't look too bad. Uh, you bumped but him. He, uh, but he uh, was under contract there and knew a lot of these people, you know. And I was real lucky. But I, uh, I got it, and that's uh, all of a sudden I was in the picture business. I was having, I was going into my third year in law school. A real tough time in the early 30s. Money was tight. I was making $8 a week working in a stock room. That wasn't doing too badly in the 1930s. Well, $8 didn't go too far. No? Well. Uh, 
So I decided to uh, stay out of school for a year, knowing that would, they would never, they signed me, you know, the usual seven-year contract with option seven years, that they would never pick up my option after the first year because I had no, uh, no experience. Uh, I wasn't interested in the picture business. I was interested in becoming an attorney. Um, never in high school did I ever go out for the school play or anything like that. Not interested. And uh, surprisingly enough, after the first year, I played in a couple of westerns there as the guys, you know, one of the two guys bringing up the rear, one of the henchmen and whatnot. Surprisingly enough, after the first year, they picked up my option for another year and gave me my raise and whatnot. And it was only then that I started to think, well, I'd better do a little work. So I went to dramatic school. They had a dramatic school right on Paramount Lot. And I did a little studying with a girl by the name of Lawton. Phyllis Lawton, who's now married to George Seaton, the director. You must know George. I do indeed. We didn't say that Gail Patrick is now Gail Patrick Jackson, one That's of the biggest right. producers on television. That's right. Perry Mason. Show. Perry Mason show. Yeah. Right. She wanted to when she came out to California to be an actress. This was just a stepping stone. She was going to be the governor of Alabama. Is that true? That's true. You That's go back and look at funny. some of the old copy when she first came out to do the Panther Woman. Um, you will see that she was going to be the governor. She's a very nice lady because I wrote her a letter... She's a very smart girl. ...a couple of years ago. I don't remember what I requested. It was something to do with the author of Perry Mason. And she wrote back. I had written to him, Earl Stanley Garner, and she wrote back and began the letter thusly, Dear Mr. Lamparski, I'm sorry to once again be in the role of the heavy. However, <laughs> turn down my request. It was a very nice letter. Uh, but I interrupted you. Well, you that's about the, your option. They picked up my option, and uh, make a long story short, I was nine years at Paramount. In the interim, uh, they loaned me out to uh, Universal Studios, which is now Universal International, and I did the Flash Gordon while I was still at Paramount, and the Buck Rogers while I was still at Paramount. And then, in uh, 1939, they made money. Paramount made money on me with these loan outs. So... Um, uh, Morris Small, who was my my agent at the time, who was the brother of Edward Small, one of the smartest producers in Hollywood, believe me. Um, Morris said, uh, listen, we'll just walk. If they want to take up our option, we'll just walk. And we'll go out and make some of this money. And that's what we did. So I went out to Universal, and I did three or four serials for them. And then I did a series of The Billy the Kids that I told you about. We did 42 of the Billy the Kid. So it was 40, 42 feature yeah. films. That's as, right. As Billy the Kid. For theater release. That's right. These uh, these still play on television from time to time if you stay up that late, you know, the late, late show or yeah. the late, late, late show. Um, all during the time that uh, I've been in the entertainment business as an actor, so-called, uh, I've had other interests. I would do first few hundred dollars that I was able to save when I first started, I invested in real estate. Not much. Unfortunately, if I could realize a little profit, I would sell. If I'd hung on to some of the stuff I'd had, I'd been in pretty good shape now, the way prices have gone up and uh, the way California has come in the last uh, 25 or 30 years. Uh, right now, I've been back uh, on the eastern seaboard here. I started with WOR and then went ABC on, on strip shows, you know, five days a week. On yeah, television. That's right, for television. I made a television series in 54 and in the second series in 56, a thing called Captain Gallant of the Foreign Legion. Uh, we made that in New York. And incidentally, Richard, the little boy that plays in it, is my son. Cuffy Crab. That's I, right. That I he, knew. Just, he just turned 21 last September. He's going, he's a sophomore at Arizona State University and doing quite well, and I'm quite proud of my boy. I also have a daughter who is married and lives um, in a place called Orinda, California. It's right across the bay from San Francisco. Nick, her husband, Nick Holt, is uh, in the stock and bond business in the Pacific Coast. You told an interesting story before we began recording, which I'd like you to repeat about uh, Captain Gallant of the Foreign Legion. I asked you if it were shown in Europe, and you told me one of the places it was shown. <laughs> this was the most stupid thing a theater manager could have ever done. The story that I told you, Richard, was um, they ran uh, this, this Foreign Legion thing. They'd cut a feature out of it, see, for European release, and it didn't do badly. But they played the thing 
in Marseille, the southern branch, you know, mm -hmm. in an Arab theater. And when the Foreign Legion, when we came on the Foreign Legion uniform, all the Arabs in the place started to riot. They tore the screen, they broke the screen, they tore up all the seats. It wrecked the theater in a matter of 15 or 20 minutes. Isn't that unbelievable that they would book that into an Arab yeah, Well, theater. they shouldn't, you know, because the Arabs hated the Legion, and the Legions hated the Legionnaires hated the Arabs. They were fighting all the time, you know. They'd been fighting these guys for years. You know, that's like sending Fiddler on the Roof with Molly Picard <laughs> yeah. to, uh, to Lebanon or, <laughs> yeah. or Syria. That's, that's right. Well, um, you had the exercise show, too, on WOR. I did it uh, not too long. Uh, I had this uh, uh, children's show in the afternoon that ran from 4, 4.30 to 5 or 5 to 5.30. They changed the time the three or four years that I was with WOR. But uh, I got the idea of doing an, an exercise show for women in the morning, women, you know, whose children had gone off to school and husbands away at work to kind of keep in shape, so to speak. And I did it for around five or six months. This is um, pre-Jack uh, Lane. And they wanted me to go back in the fall again, but they wanted to put me on too close to noontime, which I thought was wrong. It had to be around 9 to 9.30, 9.30 to 10, when the gals at home were getting their second cup of coffee and get, getting the breakfast dishes done and the house cleaning, you know, and thinking about going to shopping or maybe a two women's club. You got to get them before they leave. And I didn't feel you could around noontime. And you got the housewives before uh, they left. <laughs> yeah, if I didn't get them before they left, you'd never get them. Um, since I've been back here, which is going on 15 years now, I'm... Um, interested in and part and parcel of a very good swimming pool company located out in Edison, New Jersey, Cascade Pools, which carried, carries my name, Buster Crab Cascade Pools. I've been with them for 10 years, and we've done a very good job. I've been director of water sports at the largest resort hotel in the world, and that's the Concord Hotel located at uh, Kaimisha Lake in the Catskills. Uh, for 14 years, almost as long as I've been back here, I've operated a boys' camp in Upper State, New York. That's Camp Monaga, just outside of Saranac Lake. And I think I enjoy this about as much as anything, working with the kids all summer. They come for eight weeks. We have a very, very nice place in Upper State, New York. I um, go out from time to time. Uh, my friend Eddie Small calls me to do a film for him once in a while, whether it's a leading part or the heavy. I prefer, as a matter of fact, Richard Heavy's more interesting. You don't have to worry about is this going to be okay with the people that are watching it, you know. The nastier you are, the better. And uh, I do three or four a year. I, uh, two or three a year. I did two last year. One with um, Dan Durier for Paramount, a thing called uh, Bounty Killer. And then I did one with Audie Murphy, which was, I thought, quite a good western. And that was called Arizona Raiders, and we did that uh, at Superstition Mountain in Arizona. It was a beautiful place. I never thought I'd like the desert before, but I really like it around the Phoenix, Tempe, uh, uh, Mesa, Arizona, and we were located a little further out. I think um, an interesting point of your career is that you made two films with a lady who wasn't particularly well known at the time. One, uh, the names of the films were The Sweetheart of Sigma Chi and Thrill Mary of Lifetime. Carlisle. Well, no, I wasn't going to say Mary Carlisle because I think she was a little bit better known than the other girl was in it was Betty Grable. Well, Betty Grable, I thought, was pretty well known, you know. At that she, time? Yeah, she was the college type. She was a clean-cut looking gal, a blonde. She had a very nice figure, you know, um, good legs. They always put short skirts on her. Because I don't and remember they did her. a lot of collegiate things at that time, you mm. know, Warner Brothers. And there's a whole bunch of them, Warner Brothers and, and Paramount uh, uh, RKO Studios. Uh, she was popular. They knew her. The, the, the teenagers knew Betty Grable. Mary Carlisle, of course, they knew, too. But Do you know Betty what Mary Carlisle is doing? No, I don't. Not, I, I don't well, know. I'll tell you. I know what uh, Betty Grable is doing. Yes. Well, we don't know now. She does stop doing it. Well, I would say that... <laughs> well, she's not married anymore, unfortunately. But uh, Mary Carlisle is the manager of the Elizabeth Arden Salon in Beverly Hills. She is. She is, indeed. And I asked her to be on the program if yeah, I go to the West Coast. But I spoke to the public relations director for Elizabeth Arden, and this isn't a plug because I'm not going to say something, anything very nice. They said the only publicity they were interested in of personalities for Elizabeth Arden products or salons was with Miss Arden. 
Uh-huh. So Miss Carlyle was not available for interview. Which I is didn't a shame. know that. You know, I'm just, I've just I've I've just been uh, came back from a nine day trip to um, to the coast. I went to see my grandchildren and my daughter, of course, and my son in law, and then went down to saw my aunts and whatnot in uh, in Southern California. And I would have just liked to drop in and said hello to Mary. I haven't seen her in years. She was a real nice gal. She is on Wilshire Boulevard near Santa Monica. I know. Near where they cross the yeah. Elizabeth Arden. And please tell her I said hello. I've always thought of her as the precursor of Grace Kelly. She was so <laughs> ladylike she was. and pretty, yeah. and she still looks wonderful. Great. I saw her at a party about five years ago. Well, I drove ago. right by that corner because I went down to have a swim at the Beverly Wilshire Hotel. And the fellow that uh, runs the pool there... Clyde Swenson used to be my old swimming coach when I swam for the Hollywood Athletic Club. Well, so I wasn't too far away. I answered a question for you now. Uh-huh. What happened to Mary? What happened to Mary Carlo? She was always uh, uh, one of my favorites. You know what happened to uh, Gene Rogers, who played uh, the lead in uh, in the uh, Dale. Fashion. No, Dale. Yeah. Tell us. Well, she married a fellow by the name of um, Danny Danker who is an agent out there, and a very good one. Quite a well-known agent, they have, yes. She has a family of her own now and grown children. And uh, up until about five years ago, upon occasion, she would do something in the picture business. She was a real nice girl, Jean. She was very well-remembered. Oh, yes. For those, if, if, if nothing else. Yeah. Because uh, uh, I know the first Flash Gordon was, I think, the only one, probably still, that was budgeted at $350,000 for her. Uh, I'll tell you something else about the very first one. The big star... At uh, Universal at that time was Deanna Durbin. Her pictures made more money than any any anybody's pictures. But this year, 1936, well, the year of 37, because we finished at Christmas Eve, or the, the 23rd or 24th of December, 1936, we finished um, either 13 or 15 episodes of the first Flash Gordon. In the year 1932... In 1937, of all the pictures that were made at Universal, Deanna Durbin's picture, one of them, and I can't recall the title, was number one, Moneymaker. And number two, Flash Gordon Serial. That is amazing. Amazing for a serial. serial. But you see there, the the 10 cents or the 15 cents and or the 25 cents that they paid, if you had 13 episodes and the first episode was good, every kid would be back the next Saturday. So you got 13 15 cents or 13 10 cents or 13 25 cents. And we had them all. Yes, because, because the first episode real, was good. It was a real good serial. This is when we blasted off, me with my riding Indeed. boots and not knowing what was going to happen, you know. You and were um, you were a polo player Yale man. Is that yes, right? Yes, yeah. Gene came along with us, and we went with Dr. Zarkoff, and we didn't know what we were going to get into, but we finally met Ming and Azura. You might do a book, uh, <laughs> Your Life, uh, God, Man, and Flash Gordon of Yale. Uh, they called me, I think, at one time, the comic strip character. I did so many comic strip things. I did Red Barry and Flash Gordon and Buck Rogers, you know, Billy the Kid, all of them comic strips. That was the first night, perhaps still the only time that... A serial was booked into first-round houses. That's and, right. And That's played right. the evening performances. That's right. That because right. it was uh, it was so popular. That's right. And do you still get a lot of mail when it's shown around? I on get television? a fair amount of mail, and you know where most of it comes from right now? No. Ghana. 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 The Gold Coast. Is that the the flag they're the showing? Time. Flash Gordon. The Flash Gordons. From Ghana. What do they want to know? <laughs> they want an autographed picture. They want to know something about me. They'd see me in Flash Gordon. This was 30 years ago. I could walk right through the main street of Ghana, I'm sure. <laughs> and nobody would recognize They're being me. shown in theaters there. I don't see oh, yes. television. Been, yeah. Well, just think of, you know, I often wonder on radio, without ratings, we wonder who uh, who's listening or what type of an audience you have. But I'm, I'm really positive who's listening tonight. All those people, you know, of my age bracket, because uh, when I announced you would be on the program, and I announced it about a month ago, we've been talking about this for another yeah, week. Yeah, funny thing. Uh, the Richard, mail funny I got. Thing happened, you know, every, it seems like every weekend that I'm at the Congress, something strange or funny happens. About three weeks ago, I passed two elderly ladies. They could have been my age or maybe a little bit older. And they both smiled at me. They recognized me, and I smiled back and said, how do you do? And as I walked on by, I heard one old gal say to the other one, 
I remember him when I was that high. Flash Gordon. This old gal was my age. <laughs> she must have been, uh, you know, indicated that she was five or six years old. Couldn't have been. Impossible. Well, I had a lady on this program a couple of months ago. who was a silent film actress. And I remarked at how well she looked, because she did. She looked very, very well. And she said, oh, well, thank you very much. Because, you know, people think that I should be very old, having been in silent films. But you see, she said, I started at 11 and a half. I was a leading lady. So I took the tape. And I went home, and I was having dinner that night with a friend of mine who was also a silent screen actress. She said, well, how did it go today? And I said, well, I'll play it for you. So I played it when we finished. She had a funny look on her face, and I said, what's the matter? And she said, she was 11 and a half, darling. And I said, yes, that's what she said. And she said, I said, isn't that possible, perhaps, that at that time they started that early? Oh, absolutely, she said. I was four and a half. <laughs> As a leading lady. So, that's that. Well, I want to thank you very much for, for being here today. Think of all the, the curiosity of all those people we've satisfied as to yeah. what Buster Crab is, uh, is doing now. And you're, you're not married to Esther Williams, because a friend no, of mine said no. that's probably what happened. No, <laughs> no. Well, I want to thank you too, Richard, for having me in. And uh, I've enjoyed reminiscing with you. You, uh, you know an awful lot, uh, and I can go back, uh, I, uh, I think, as far as you can. In the picture business, a lot of the uh, a lot of the people now that uh, we knew, you know, or at least I knew, have gone on, unfortunately. But it's been pleasant uh, being with you today, and I sure appreciate it. Thank you very much. It has indeed. Thank you, Mr. Larry Buster Crab. presents the Silver Theater, starring Jack Benny and Mary Livingston in The Amazing Mr. Williams. Brought to you by International Sterling, world-famous solid silver. And here with a word for you is the director of Silver Theater, Conrad Nagel. Thank you, Henry Charles, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome again to Silver Theater, friends. Well, tonight is Silver Theater's last dramatic broadcast for this season. And your favorite radio team, Jack Benny and Mary Livingston, is here to help make this farewell show a happy and hilarious one. In just a moment, the curtain will go up on Act One. But before it does, we're going to do a little quick delving into the past of John Keats, the poet. It was he who penned those simple words, a thing of duty is a joy forever. And that's thought seems to us a very excellent stage setting for what Henry Charles is here to tell you about. Well, ladies and gentlemen, it would almost seem that those words were written about International Sterling's Royal Danish pattern. For Royal Danish is a thing of beauty, and to every woman who owns it will be a joy forever. Perhaps it's the cool elegance of that plain lustrous shaft or the richness of that coronet-like tip. Perhaps it's no one detail but the resplendent...